welcome everybody um, to this Fuse Physical Activity Group pop-up workshop. Um, and to a, and and also to welcome a um, a very special um, speaker uh, to, for this for this evening. Um, so you, the title is the physical activity, the environment, wider systems change, um, and we're very well uh, looking very much looking forward to welcoming Professor James uh, Salas as his Sunday name. So Jim Salas will be joining us uh, very soon. I'm delighted to be here to welcome you all as director of. Uh, views um, and um, uh, and to, uh, very much looking forward to this um, event. Laura, could you just put the next slide on, please? So just to run through the programme for today, I'm just going to do a, a little bit of housekeeping and um, to think about um, how are they how we're going to make this work. Uh, we're all getting very used to working in this environment, um, but I have to say I'm very much looking forward to being able to do this in person at some day in the not too distant future. So we have Jim Salas speaking and I'll introduce him in just a moment. And then uh, Mal uh, Fitzgerald, who's the programme director from South Tees, will, um, will be for the delivery pilot we'll be speaking. We'll have an opportunity for some questions and answers, and we're going to use the chat function for some of that as well. We'll have a very brief break, and then from 6 till 6.30, there's going to be an informal discussion um, for those that are able to stay, to stay with us. Um, so, uh, Laura, next slide, please. So just to think about the, how we're going to do this, I think uh, Mark has already muted your uh, microphone. So keep, please keep it muted unless you um, come to speak in the Q, in the Q and A. If you can stop your own video, it'll help with um, the the uh, quality. Um, but please do put your camera on if you're speaking or during the session after six o'clock. Uh, during the presentation, the, please put your questions into the chat box and I'll monitor those and then I'll be ready to put some questions to the speakers and I may invite you to then ask those questions. Um, during the social, if you want to speak, if you put a question mark in the chat box or raise your hand and we'll manage them that way. Um, and I'm sure the last point won't be um, won't be necessary, but if you do feel that um, anybody's behaving inappropriately, please mention message Laura Ritson. Thank you very much. OK, and obviously be professional. Can we um, just this is now a, um, a plug. Um, so our next um, pop up uh, physical activity workshop is uh, is 20 plenty for health will be uh, Professor Ruth Jepson and that's on the 18th of November and registration available in the usual place on the FUSE website for events. Um, and so next slide please Laura. I'm going to perhaps uh, break with tradition and make some thank yous before we even start. Um, so I'm going to thank our speakers, Jim Salas and Mal Fitzgerald, and the FUSE team, all of the people who've been involved in organising this event, and also the FUSE Physical Activity Group um, team, Scott Lloyd, Louise Hayes, Ali Innard, Scott, uh, Caroline uh, Donald Reynolds, Natalie Connor, Nicola McCulloch, uh, Dave Archer and Oliver Bell. Uh, Oliver Bell. And I think finally the thanks are to all of you for um, attending. It's really great to be able to get this level of engagement from people across views and beyond uh, when we're all actually still at, at home. And that then brings us to the opportunity that this um, brings us because it does mean that we can bring illustrious speakers um, from around, across the globe um, and not um, have to uh, bother them with traveling across the Atlantic or else or elsewhere. So it is my real pleasure to introduce uh, Professor James Salas. Um, probably doesn't need very much introduction, but um, uh, Jim is the Distinguished Professor in the Department of Family Medicine and Public Health at the University of California, San Diego. Um, he's author of almost 500 uh, publications and is one of the most cited uh, uh, authors in social sciences. Um, he, he received the Lifetime Achievement Award from the President's Council on Fitness, Sports and Nutrition. Um, and Time Magazine identified him as an obesity warrior. What a fantastic title. Um, and I hope that after we've heard Jim speak, we can all um, become obesity warriors. Um, I'm gonna make a, a 
a quote, just read a quote from um, from Jim um, on his um, web website um, as an intro, and then just to say, in, his, in my view, he says, in my view, the root cause of low activity levels are tied to technology advances that reduce or eliminated the need for physical activity in work. That's computers. Guess what we're all doing right now? Transportation, cars household appliances, and certainly mine have been working very hard during the last six months, and leisure, TV, internet, video games, and in the domains of life. So we're actually um, demonstrating a number of these today. Um, I hope you're all on standing desks and you're all jogging whilst we listen to Jim um, speak. Jim, you're very welcome. Um, we very much look forward to hearing you speak. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ashley, for that very nice introduction. And um, uh, I especially appreciated that you encouraged people to, um, uh, to be active and standing while um, uh, participating today. That's what I'm doing. So, uh, so that's good. We can, we can mitigate some of the damages of, of our technology if we uh, put our minds to it. So I'm going to get started here. Let me set up my, my slides and minimize this one. Uh, okay, uh, so um, I, I made a little, uh, a little shift in my focus. Um, I, I thought instead of presenting our international work, I'm going to present mostly our U.S. work. Um, and that's because we have more details and more uh, a wider range of uh, outcomes and findings to look at. But um, I, I can assure you that from our um, IPEN uh, adult international study, um, findings uh, are are similar or even stronger um, in an international context. So I'm going to go through very quickly um, the highlights of 20 years of research that we've been doing in the U.S. on built environments, physical activity, and uh, and obesity, really. Um, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to talk with uh, you folks today and. Uh, I've had a chance to uh, be briefed and have some discussion about the work that, that's been going on in South Tees uh, and the, the, the broad um, uh, data collection that's been happening and the planning for a comprehensive multi-level uh, physical activity intervention, which uh, I think is, is the right way to go and is just as relevant now as before the pandemic. So uh, a, a brief outline here. I'm actually going to start with um, uh, giving a, a little information about physical activity and COVID-19, because I'm concerned that this, uh, the evidence about this is just really not known. Um, so we'll start with that. And then I'm going to uh, talk about findings that we have on design of the macro environments. And by that, I mean basically the layout of cities and communities in relation to physical activity, and then a little bit on the design of micro environments. Um, and by that, I mean uh, the design of streetscapes, uh, uh, footpaths, street crossings, aesthetics, that sort of thing. So, uh, and then if we have time, um, I'd like to uh, mention um, uh, some of uh, uh, just a, a little bit of our work on uh, built environment relevance for infectious diseases, because I, I think this is uh, not well appreciated either. So uh, I'm going to go pretty fast uh, because I'm going to uh, try to uh, put a lot into uh, into my time. So uh, I want to start with is physical activity relevant for COVID-19? And this a uh, picture from my neighborhood near the beach in San Diego shows that, well, certainly COVID-19 was relevant for physical activity because um, as we started the, the, the shutdowns, 
um, uh, this uh, boardwalk and beach were completely closed, as you can see. Um, and so these are uh, prime areas for physical activity. So the physical activity that used to be done here is, was either stopped or uh, done somewhere else, and, and we're not sure which. And this is, a, I think, an important research question worldwide. Um, but I'm, I'm gonna focus more on how relevant is physical activity for responding to the, the, uh, the pandemic. And uh, just a brief little background here. Um, uh, I am pre pre preparing for a talk that I gave in India in mid-February, I uh, educated myself about uh, the physical activities impact on immune function and inflammation because I was at a conference on uh, uh, inflammation, immunity, and cancer. Um, and so um, uh, uh, as that conference was going on, concern about the, the pandemic was heating up. And I said, well, wait a minute. Uh, what I just learned about um, is uh, uh, for immunity and inflammation is also relevant to how the body responds to an infection. So, um, uh, but nobody's talking about physical activity as a way to improve responses to the uh, to the pandemic. So um, with a colleague, Michael Pratt, who you may have heard of from, uh, who used to be at Centers for Disease Control, um, we, we put together, um, I, uh, really, a, I would say a, a light literature review um, with this title, Multiple Benefits of Physical Activity During the Pandemic. And I'm just going to briefly show you the six ways that physical activity uh, can uh, should help control the pandemic. And the first I've already mentioned, moderate physical activity, like walking, enhances immune function and reduces inflammation. And this is these are the direct um, ways that the body responds to the, the, the virus uh, infection. So uh, it's interesting that extended vigorous physical activity like running a marathon seems to reduce immune function, but walking is ideal and accessible uh, activity for most people. Second benefit, moderate uh, physical activity can improve the common chronic conditions that increase risk for severe COVID-19 and death. So about 95% of all COVID deaths, um, certainly in the US, and I assume that's true around the world, are in people with chronic conditions um, like um, heart disease, diabetes, obesity, hypertension. Um, and, uh, and we know physical activity is a strong preventive and treatment uh, strategy for all of those. Um, so this is extremely relevant. And as I think of it, the uh, pandemic, the infectious disease pandemic is uh, revealing uh, the failure of our uh, health systems to uh, prevent chronic diseases. Okay, third, moderate physical activity is one of the best stress management methods um, and can uh, help prevent and treat anxiety, depression, and, and related uh, problems. And uh, my reading of the literature and, and reviews for years is that physical activity is as effective as a treatment for uh, depression and anxiety as medications and psychotherapy. They're all similarly effective. So, and again, not being used um, adequately in this pandemic. Fourth, stress and distress cause imbalances of the hormone cortisol that negatively affect uh, immune function and inflammation. And you can probably guess physical activity helps bring cortisol into balance as a way of uh, uh, resolving uh, physiological stress. So this is also another way of, of another pathway for improving immune function and inflammation. Fifth, moderate physical activity produces antioxidants that reduce the severity of acute respiratory distress syndrome, which is a serious uh, and common complication of COVID-19 mainly for people who are hospitalized. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, 
both acute and chronic physical activity improve immune responses to vaccines. Oh, and in just one example of a study, older adults assigned to aerobic exercise were 30 to 100% more likely than a flexibility control group to attain sufficient antibodies from flu vaccines. This seems um, urgently um, uh, important to, um, uh, uh, to you know, make people more aware of. And um, this immune response uh, effect is most important to older people because as we age, our immune systems become less efficient. So uh, my feeling is we uh, older people need every benefit they can get. So I've been trying to find ways of communicating this to people doing vaccine studies so that they can test this, um, the effect of physical activity um, on um, uh, COVID-19 vaccines. But of course, that's not my world. So we have not had much uh, success doing that. So anyway, that's a, a little bit of an introduction to why um, uh, uh, physical activity is uh, maybe more important than it was before. Um, the pandemic, but certainly relevant to the pandemic. And as far as I can tell, uh, severely underused as a strategy and a remedy um, for multiple aspects of this pandemic. Okay, so let's, let's move on uh, to built environment and physical activity. Uh, when we started this research um, uh, 20 years ago, uh, we didn't have uh, an idea about what is an active living community or an activity supportive community? Now we have a good idea and it consists of these elements at, at least. Um, and so this is uh, illustrated around the home neighborhood. So uh, I, I would say probably the, the most fundamental thing is uh, the community design um, so that destinations are within walking distance uh, from the home. And these destinations could be shops, restaurants, workplaces, schools. So, um, and that uh, if you want people to walk to somewhere, that somewhere has to be within walking distance. And so then we, we go down to schools and work sites. And so there's proximity and accessibility. There's also the design of the the, the buildings and the, the uh, surrounding area themselves, and can you, uh, can you be active around the buildings? And then you can look at policies, uh, such as with this school here, are the recreation facilities open to use by the public outside of school hours? And then if we want people to be active for recreation, they need places to do that. And those can be public places like parks. They can be private places like uh, health clubs and dance studios and martial arts studios. Um, uh, but people need places uh, to be active. And then it is possible um, to have uh, destinations within walking distance, uh, schools accessible, parks accessible, and still not have an active living community if the transportation system is uh, blocks you from walking and biking. Uh, and in the United States, of course, that's, that's very common. Um, uh, the uh, transportation policy in our country is very simple, move as many cars as fast as possible. Um, and so that's uh, been, a, been a problem. Um, so our transportation system is really a barrier uh, to uh, active transportation, such as walking, biking, and, and transit. So this is kind of an overview of the, the macro design uh, of a community. And uh, all, of those, all of those elements that we just looked at, the, um, the design of neighborhood, uh, transportation facilities, rec facilities, schools and workplaces are designed and managed by groups that are not public health. So public health does not have a role in making decisions about any of these uh, elements of an active living community. So we have we must partner um, with planners, transportation engineers, park and rec, landscape architects, educators and architects. 
if we are to educate them about why and how to design healthier communities. So that's, that's a very important uh, uh, element here. So now let's, let's get into the, the data. Um, and so I told you I want to talk about macro level design. Uh, and I'm showing you on the top um, uh, a, uh, a community, a well-known community in the United States, uh, which happens to be the best designed for physical activity. And you will recognize that as uh, Manhattan in New York. Um, and you can see what, what makes it uh, good for physical activity. Well, you can see the large Central Park there. Um, you, can, uh, you can't see the, the mixed land use. You can't see that destinations are scattered throughout the entire city so that everybody uh, in, in New York City, essentially, certainly in Manhattan, has everything they need within walking distance, whether that's a hardware store or a bookstore or a cafe. Um, the streets are in a grid pattern, the famous grid pattern uh, of, of Manhattan, so that you have direct routes. You can go different uh, um, routes each time you go somewhere. And of course, the density is high. Uh, the density is needed to support the mixed use. Um, so uh, that's a, another element. On the bottom is the opposite. Um, it's, uh, it's all low density, uh, no tall buildings at all. Um, it is uh, not mixed land use. It's virtually all residential from what I can see. The streets are not connected. So um, if you wanted to uh, uh, go from one side of that freeway to the other, you could not walk, you prohibited from walking, and you would uh, have to drive. Um, uh, so, and uh, maybe there are some parks, the hill looks like a park, but I, I, don't, I don't see other parks, uh, at least big ones. So, um, um, and I like to show this picture because people think, yeah, that's, that's everywhere in America, that's probably San Diego. But no, uh, um, uh, I use this to show that um, uh, uh, unhealthy uh, urban design is not uh, restricted to affluent countries. This is uh, Cape Town, South Africa. Um, so it looks like any suburb in the United States. Um, so uh, this is this is a global problem, and I, I'm going to just very uh, quickly summarize what's in the the, the title here and the subtitle. Uh, what we're finding that cities can be designed to move people or to move cars, um, but I haven't seen cities yet that are optimized for both. Uh, so you kind of have to make a choice. So let, let's go to uh, data now. This was our first study that we did in this series of studies. We call it the Neighborhood Quality of Life Study. And you see, we started it about 20 years ago. Um, and we're, we're studying, the, the purpose was to uh, study people that live in different kinds of neighborhoods and see if their physical activity differs. So this was a, a cross-sectional study, but it was uh, had a special design because we wanted to make sure we maximized the variability um, in walkability or built environment. So we chose, we identified and chose neighborhoods that were both low and high in walkability and then selected or recruited uh, residents of those neighborhoods. This study was done in adults, so these data will be adults. And um, you see, we were interested in uh, our, if walkability has an effect, or is that effect um, equitable across low and high socioeconomic status? So we, we built that into the design. So I'm going to, uh, we, we did this, uh, we had about 2,200 adults in, in two parts of the country, uh, near Seattle, Washington on the West Coast, and in the Baltimore, Washington, D.C. area uh, on the East Coast. And uh, so um, we, uh, this is the, the first um, outcome I'm going to show you. This is uh, reported walking for transportation. Um, minutes per day walking for transportation. And what you see here is the green bars, um, people in high walkable neighborhood, 
uh, they are walking much more for transportation than people in the low walkable um, neighborhoods with the, the purple bars. And, you know, uh, uh, three uh, or two to, um, to five times as much, really big difference. And um, uh, th uh, the difference was bigger in the high income uh, uh, group, but you can also see there is a difference, a, a substantial difference in the low income group as well. So if we look at leisure walking, we weren't exactly expecting leisure walking to be different by walkability. Uh, walkability is more about walking to destinations, but we did see a difference. And here the, uh, the differences are more similar um, across high and low income. What we were most interested in is total physical activity. Uh, when you look at all the physical activity people do, is there a difference? And we measured this by accelerometers, um, which are electronic devices that tell us every minute um, how much people are moving. And they wear these uh, little devices on, on their belts uh, for a week, actually two weeks in this study. And so we see what we uh, expected to see, what we hypothesize, more people were more totally active in uh, if they lived in walkable neighborhoods. And you see the difference, and, and the, the differences were similar uh, with low income and high income, a difference of about five minutes uh, per day for low income and seven minutes per day for high income. And you'd say, you might say, well, that's not, that doesn't seem like very big differences. Would we redesign our cities just for that? But let's, let's look at the potential of that. Um, and so uh, um, the, the, let's take the seven minutes per day. That's approximately 50 minutes per week. And if you walked very slowly, uh, uh, that would be uh, two additional miles per week. And that would uh, add up to 100 miles per year. And that would roughly translate to 10,000 10, more uh, calorie expenditure per year. And that translates into uh, almost three pounds or uh, 1.3 kilogram um, weight not gained or potentially weight lost, every, everything else being, uh, being equal. So um, that is more than the average adult weight gain per year in the US. So uh, a little bit of activity over time uh, adds up. Uh, to, to a substantial health impact. And, and so in, you might not be surprised by these results showing that percent, the percent overweight or obese is higher in the low walkable neighborhoods. Um, and so that is, that is quite clear here. And um, uh, basically similar uh, uh, differences for the low income and high income. All right, so that's the that's our adult study. Oh, one other. Um, if there's anybody uh, in the audience maybe interested in uh, climate change and uh, reducing greenhouse gases, um, looks like walkable neighborhoods is a way to do that because people in low in uh, low walkable neighborhoods they have to go places, uh, but they also have to drive. They are automobile dependent, so they drive twice as much. Uh, as people in the high walkable neighborhoods, regardless of their of their income, um, and driving itself is sitting, so it is not healthy. So um, uh, that's another uh, couple of benefits from walkable neighborhoods. Okay, so we said, all right, that that's what happens in uh, adults. What about uh, in youth? So we did another study. Uh, very similar design with uh, adolescents that we call this our teen study. And what, what did we have here? We had about 900 uh, youth, uh, ages 12 to 16. So what did we find? We found the same thing. So you can see here, uh, this is accelerometer based physical activity. It's uh, almost identical findings, about six minutes or six, seven minutes difference um, in uh, physical activity per day, uh, objectively measured. Um, we also found more walking to school, uh, a particularly big difference in the high income, uh, but more walking to school in, in both. 
we also found less sedentary time, less screen time um, in the walkable neighborhoods. Um, maybe the, the kids were able to go out more. Uh, we're not really sure, but uh, that's a pretty big difference in, uh, in screen time. Um, and then we, we did another study with older adults. This is led by our colleague, uh, Abby King at Stanford um, uh, with uh, adults 65 years and over. And uh, this is less dramatic, but we do see higher uh, total physical activity with accelerometers in the high walkable neighborhoods. Um, what you're seeing here is the, um, but the, the, the amount of physical activity, this is per week, is much, much lower in the adults, regardless of where they live. It's the, the activity level is lower, um, but especially low in the, the low walkable neighborhoods. Uh, we see uh, a, a a much more dramatic effect on walking for uh, transportation. Um, and um, again, you can see here, you know, in the, uh, the high income, there's about a, a, a tenfold difference. And in the, the low walkable neighborhood, there's, there's about a threefold uh, difference um, favoring the walkable communities. And with uh, body mass index, um, we're seeing lower body mass index, so less risk of overweight and obesity um, in, the, in the high walkable. So, so but what do we see here? I didn't show you our children's results. We don't, we don't have really the physical activity um, uh, measured in the, uh, or looked at in the same way. But the design of cities uh, we found in the US was related to active transportation and total physical activity among adolescents, adults, and older adults. And design of cities re was related to body mass index um, in uh, uh, adults and older adults, but not, not the adolescents for some reason. And in our uh, international studies done on, on four continents, we, we basically replicate this. People in walkable neighborhoods do more total physical activity, more walking for transport, more walking for leisure, and they have lower risk of overweight and obesity. So this is a, um, uh, uh, international evidence. Okay, so briefly, let me, let me uh, go um, uh, down from the sky onto the street level, the micro level. And I call this the design of streetscapes. Um, and here we see also the difference of um, the, the top picture is designing for cars. If you want cars, if you want to move cars as fast as possible, then you design uh, streets like you see on the top. Lots of space, the cars can go fast. And if your goal is to move cars, you don't care about pedestrians. So you don't have a footpath. You don't care if this gentleman um, who is trying to take a walk, improve his health, you don't mind that he is having a terrible experience uh, and probably won't do that again. Put yourself in that picture. I'm sure we've all walked along streets like that. It is not pleasant. And uh, as you can see uh, here, it's not safe. If you want to design streets for pedestrians, they're probably going to look something like the picture on the bottom with less space for cars, nice wide footpaths, places to go on, on the street so that as you walk down the footpath, you have interesting things to look at, not just parked cars. Um, and uh, here they're providing an aesthetically pleasant um, uh, a situation with the trees. So um, again, designing for cars or people, that is the choice we need to make. Um, and we, um, we wanted to quantify these differences. You know, let's, can we put a number on the, what you might call the activity supportiveness here? So we developed a measure we called the MAPS Mini. We started out with a very long one and then made it very short so it can be used by practitioners and advocates and just residents. Um, and, um, and so you walk down the street and you code whether you see any of these things. So the, the short version, you can see the items on uh, the, left, the left column. 
And uh, then what do we have in this, uh, in this graph? We have um, the, uh, for each uh, of four age groups, we have um, the association between whether um, this, uh, each item is present and whether that's significantly related to uh, active transport, basically walking for transportation. And we wanted to identify or isolate the effect of the uh, streetscape design. So we statistically adjusted for the macro walkability. So what you see here, if there's a box in a cell, um, that means there was a significant association and the darker the color in the box, the, uh, the stronger the association. And so you can see for, and, uh, for adults, almost all items are related significantly to, um, uh, uh, to walking for transport. And for children, most of them are. For adults, some of them are. And for adolescents, few of them are. Um, and I put in uh, uh, red the items um, that were significant in at least three um, of the age groups. So street lights, benches. So uh, you think oh, benches, they don't help you walk, but you're not gonna sit in a bench unless you walk to it. So, uh, and it might be particularly helpful for older adults. Having a sidewalk or footpath, basic infrastructure, buffer, separating people on the footpath from, um, from uh, traffic. Uh, and then curb cuts, which is helpful for um, mothers with prams and then older adults. But the key here is you, if you look at the, the bottom row, you see the grand score for active transport. So we took out the aesthetic aspects. And for the grand score, this is significant. The, the overall score is significant for every age group. Um, so you can uh, you can see that there. So again, if you design for activity, it seems to work for the whole community, uh, all all age groups. And just uh, briefly, um, this um, uh, relationship is is linear. So the greater the um, uh, the score, uh, the 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 better. And so no matter where your neighborhood, what score it is to begin with, if you improve the streetscape, then you, you, should, uh, you, you might expect to get more walking. And so since I'm at time, I'm going to skip this. Maybe we can come back to it um, in, the, in the discussion, uh, but I want to alert you to two uh, websites that might be useful. One is active living research. There's just a, a, a wealth of information there from scientific papers to uh, uh, summaries of uh, findings for lay audiences, to reports, to slides, to infographics, as you see some infographics here. And then at the bottom is my website. So there's um, uh, many measures, uh, access to lots of my papers, blogs, uh, uh, link to my my video blog where I comment on streetscapes around the world. Um, and um, so I am going to stop there and uh, thank you for your attention. And uh, uh, if you're not already standing, I will encourage you to take a standing <laughs> break. So Ashley, back to you. Jim, thank you very much. I'm, um, I'm hoping everybody can hear me. Um, I think um, I'm going to actually give a clap and I'm going to invite everybody to give a virtual clap. So let's just have, have some claps on here. So thank you very much, Jim. Um, I was particularly struck listening to that. I think there was a couple of things. One, in terms of the ageing um, and, immuni and immunity and the role of physical activity, particularly in the light of our aging population across the world. Um, and that was, seemed just a really important aspect. And that what the walkability scores that you put up there at the end, the importance of that for street planners, for town planners, and those really simple measures that can make such a difference. So um, thank you, thank you, Jim, a masterclass um, and a, a, a fantastic um, breadth 
of, of bringing in all of that work that you have done over a number of years and really fascinating. I'm going to pause and now ask Mal um, to, to, um, to, to speak, I think Mal, um, and to respond. And whilst he's um, putting, off his, um, putting on his camera and everything else, just to introduce Mal. So Mal is a programme director for You've Got This. He's got over 25 years of experience in senior leadership with a background in law, training and development, supporting building and the capacity of people and organisations in communities. Um, and I know has had um, experience in the voluntary sector and also in terms of in very much involved in local, uh, regional and national strategic partnerships. So with an interest in complex systems and physical activities. So Mal, I think you're going to give us some um, a, a, just a, a, a bit of a, a, a verbal presentation and then we're going to open this up to questions. So please, I encourage you to put some questions into the chat um, so that we've got some um, ready and our speakers can start to look at those. So Mal, over to you. Thanks very much, Ashley. So what I'm going to try to do, and, and I don't have any data to report, which is why I'm not going to present any slides. And really, I just want to, to stimulate some discussion talk about the pilots if people aren't aware of what a local delivery pilot is um, and, and set into context what some core tenants of the pilots are um, but also what I really want to do is start to describe some of our experiences of trying to stimulate a systemic response to the pandemic and how we've we've done that um, through through different media and through different partners so nationally Sport England established 12 local delivery pilots each local delivery pilot is very different in very diverse locations. Some are city-based, some are very rural, some are very coastal uh, of, of varying sizes. The, the largest being Greater Manchester down to Withensea, which has a total population of, of 6,000 people. So they're diverse in terms of geography and, and settings. Um, but each pilot has uh, three kind of core tenants that it, it's working to. The first is trying to tackle whole system change approach to inactivity. So really thinking about how we create a shared value of physical activity, not just within communities, but within the systems that surround and support people. Um, distributed leadership is another core element. How do we ensure that everyone uh, sees that they have a role in tackling inactivity and health inequalities? So that could be the chief exec of the local authority, it could be an administrator in a small community based organisation or a volunteer on a, on a gardening project. So everyone has a contribution and role in, in creating that system and, and keeping that system healthy. And the final one really is, is utilising behaviour change strategies and using all the tools that are available to in terms of literature and the research, but also the kind of the practitioners, um, how do we change the behaviour of people in communities, but also how do we change the culture and behaviour of organisations to, to ensure that they're really promoting and supporting people to live healthier, more active lives. So recently um, we had made an application for further investment from Sport England and in the back end of 2019, we secured a, a multi-million pound investment to start to deliver and develop some of the plans with local organizations and communities. And as well as working in four very specific targeted communities, we were working with a range of, uh, of professionals across themes. So we were working with uh, people in uh, type two diabetes. We were working with health professionals who were supporting people that were listed for surgery. Uh, and we were also working with other organisations, with management organisations. So we had a very diverse range of organisations and people re ready and willing to go. And then the pandemic struck. So we had to respond very, very quickly. How do we, as a small organisation, bringing partners together, stimulate systemic response to this issue and this, this pandemic? So the first thing we did was we worked with local authorities who... Um, set up emergency uh, telephone hubs so people who had concerns and issues who were who were who were you know isolated could phone into that um, uh, those hubs and uh, get advice from call handlers. Now, as part of that, we uh, as part of that, we um, 
we asked if we could get physical activity uh, questions onto those uh, scripts that call handlers were using to check to see if people were able to maintain their physical activity, if they needed support and help, if they weren't quite sure how they could, you know, remain active while in lockdown, they would, you know, point and direct us to various resources. So we really tried to, to build some kind of capacity into those, those call handling services. The second thing we did is we established four social media platforms very quickly, uh, two very public facing to provide support uh, and, and two very professional facing so we could get local organizations and agencies to provide support to people. So if people were working from home, were, in, were employers encouraging people working from home to remain active, to take regular breaks, all those kinds of things. And we were using platforms like LinkedIn and Twitter to get those messages out. Um, a particular godsend during this time was that we were working with a company called Word Nerds, who has uh, developed a, a, what's called a sentiment analysis piece of software. And, and essentially this uses big data to scour uh, social media feeds, not only to find out what people are saying about particular themes, whether it's lockdown or the pandemic or not being able to keep physically active, but not what they're talking about, but how they're talking about it as well. So if they're expressing, you know, happiness or fear or anger or frustration. Uh, and from that, we were able to shape some of our social media messages that we put out. So we, we very quickly picked up that there was a lot of anxiety from people who weren't taking up on their one a day physical activity opportunity. Um, there were there were concerned about people not observing social distancing or cyclists cycling past them. So we used that information to put out some messages through social media just to encourage people to take that one day opportunity, but also to uh, to send out messages to other people to say, you know, people are concerned about being outside. Please remember to socially distance, you know, respect other people who are using public spaces. So we really try to reinforce some of those positive messages that were, that were coming through there. Um, we also did some very practical things. We worked with uh, Tees Valley Sport, which is our local active partnership. And we created an initiative called Bags of Fun. So it became very obvious that there were specific populations that were more, uh, more impacted by the, by the pandemic and were not able to uh, get out and exercise, particularly uh, children and families that had special educational needs or mobility or disability issues. So we worked with some special schools who provided special uh, educational opportunities. We worked with local youth organisations and, and asked them what kinds of things would help. And we developed bags of fun, which had a range of uh, different pieces of uh, kind of play equipment in there and also various cards suggesting different activities that they could do and those went out to different organizations like carers organizations and local schools uh, and, and a whole host of voluntary and community organizations that really had far better connections into some of those populations than we could ever hope to have so kind of stimulating and using the system that support people to get to those uh, people who needed that support the most we also used sentiment analysis to kind of track uh, trends, so things like Joe Wicks and some of the national campaigns from Sport England like This Girl Can and the Undefeatables campaign to see if people locally were using those and promoting them to support old people, uh, maybe who have long term conditions or are particularly frail um, and, and a whole host of other things in terms of the social media stuff just to re keep reinforcing those really positive messages, those messages of reassurance getting uh, and where we where we knew all the people who were digitally isolated we tried to get messages out to siblings and grandchildren and, and sons and daughters to really encourage them to ensure that you know to look after the welfare of their parents and really help and support them to maintain their activity levels during this time uh, just a final couple of bits um, within some of the most uh, disadvantaged communities that we worked with we we became children weren't getting homeschooled they weren't uh, getting any opportunity for for a uh, kind of structured regular physical activity opportunities as they would have done in school so we very quickly pulled together a process 
which is, you know, really we, we knew what we wanted, but we didn't know how to get there. So we brought partners together, um, outlined the insight that we had, what the issues were, and we said, we're not quite sure what, what we want, but we'd like you to, to work together as a partnership and develop some, uh, some ideas about how we can encourage outdoor play, outdoor education. And when schools do come back on board to support schools at using outdoor spaces more, um, so far that's been running over the summer. That's gonna be a, a 12 month piece of work. There's been a fabulous response from, from children and families and communities in utilizing existing outdoor spaces and not taking them to spaces that are 20 minutes, half an hour away, but just using the spaces that are around them to really start building an appreciation of uh, local uh, local outdoor spaces and to hopefully build that through the winter months when we know that traditionally uh, physical activity opportunities really decline through this time. Um, I hope that's given you a, a really quick whistle stop tour of our system response to the pandemic and more than happy to, to answer questions but would really if you've heard anything that you think I'm really in interested in that please get in touch because diffusing the system is really about um, making connections with people and, and, and really starting to build those relationships so thanks very much Ashley. Thank you, thank you, Mel. And um, again, you know, my my appreciation um, in in sound and others can do virtually. Thank you, thank you very much.